Hey, deserving listeners, sister wives, let's watch. How about you, Mayor? Big Bear, getting after the kids. You guys, these are your brothers and sisters, whether you like it or not. And you better start treating them like it. Okay, so for Mary, her most embarrassing moment was that moment. I believe this is that moment with the van. And was that, is that that same moment? It was around that time. It's around the same season. And I think... Janelle was trying to deal with it, but then it was pat the the baton was passed over to Mary. Mary's around a corner, maybe on purpose to get away from the camera, and but she sells the lapel mic on, so she's raising her voice, and sh that was embarrassing for Mary. Don't give me that. I see it. I didn't think the cameras were there, and all of a sudden I saw them running around the corner <laughs> and watching me yelling at the kids. For me, that was one of. Okay, so it sounds like Mary is okay with that style of parenting, but she's embarrassed that it was caught on camera. And yeah, uh, uh, from my memory and from the little bit we saw there, it's, it's not inherently a bad parenting style. Uh, your proudest moments. Really? Mm -hmm. That was a hard one for me. I get it. Nobody wants to be the parent yelling at their children, no. even though they need it. Yeah. Um, for me and I think that kind of says something about Mary's typical parenting. And maybe for Mary, it's easier. Earlier, they had the kids on, and they were saying, you know, which mom is the most strict? And some were saying Christine, and some were saying Mary. They were all kind of agreeing that Janelle was the easiest, which I found to be interesting, which makes me wonder if, well, that's interesting now I think about it. And I would see that when I would go into homes to help parents I would uh, see a certain style of parenting, and if I uh, didn't watch it, I would assume that what I'm seeing is what they are doing all the time. But they know that they're being kind of scrutinized. I would emphasize to them, I'm not scrutinizing them <laughs> or judging them. I'm there to help them. But, you know, it's natural for parents to um, try. It's sort of like how you might floss a lot just be, just before going to the dentist. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> that you would do that, but it's natural. I've done it before. So for Janelle, it could be, you know, when you think about how the boys are pretty, in terms of what we've seen, there's been some scenes of violence and taking matters into their own hands. And uh, Janelle, given her subdued, maybe depressed style, she just lets them do what they want and has on average allowed her kids way more freedom and she has a passive style of parenting and then when the cameras are there she's like okay i've got to show something but she she's not practiced in how to deal with it so she comes out of the gate really strong not super strong she's not being abusive really but she's like you're done and i'm taking this and i'm doing this and and that's her saying, okay, well, the camera's here. I have to do something. And then when the cameras leave, she goes back to just letting them do what they want and work their own stuff out. There's pros and cons to that. One of the cons is that you can have kids that develop ways of responding to each other that is problematic, like violent. It's interesting. It's interesting to think about. I don't want to come across like I'm judging Janelle or any of the parents. The kids seem relatively happy, but there's almost no data as to where that is. I will say that Janelle's kids, in terms of the edit, seem to present with the most unhappiness. Logan seems very happy. <laughs> Madison seems very happy. Hunter, at this point, seems pretty happy, but he's exhibited unhappiness in the past. Garrison and Gabriel, they show a lot of fighting between the two of them. Savannah, I don't remember... Uh, Savannah is very easy, according to Janelle. Uh, I don't want to blame the parents. I'm sure we'll never have enough information to say anything about their parenting, but it's just food for thought. Be giving attention to another guy. How would it make you feel? The vulgarity of the idea of you with two husbands or another lover um, sickens me. All of it was embarrassing. It was the question. My answer was idiotic. I never met. Okay, for him, it was that moment that's the most embarrassing. He says his answer was idiotic. Huh. Well, I wonder what answer he would have preferred to have given. I'm very curious about that. 
meant it to be anything against you. I was just wanting you to just maybe see things from a different perspective. So I apologize. Interesting. Mary does a lot of saving of Cody. You know, it could be a good thing, but it's notable that they do have their roles. Janelle is mostly shut down. Christine is the... She's she's more focused on herself, not in a pathological way, and she's more vocal, and she's she has preferences, and she doesn't mind stating it, which there's pros and cons of that. Robin is kind of... She comes across like she th thinks of herself as superior. I, I don't think she actually thinks that she's superior, but the kind of vibe or the way she comes across, that's the way I'm reading it. Of, And there's pros and cons of that. Not superior, but that she feels like she is there as a, in a leadership-ish position. Like there was earlier when Christine was like, I don't want to talk about that. And Cody's like, you should talk about that. And Mary and Janelle are... They don't, I don't think they even have an impulse to step in on those conversations, but Robin often will. She'll often say, hey, you know, take it easy on Christine. She's directing Cody often, Robin is. So there's that. And there's other examples too of, of Robin feeling like she's the one that's trying to get people to do the things that she wants them to do or the things they said they were gonna do. And then who'd I leave out? So uh, Mary is the nice one, I think, and the easy one, and the helper, the one that is there to smooth things over. Yeah, because that's certainly not Janelle, certainly not Christine, and it's not Robin. So Mary is the every you know the the pleaser, the one that's going to get everyone to get along, at least at this point. Take a trip for the summer, hey. A few years ago, we started seeing a family counselor and marriage therapist in Utah. Her name is Pat, and she actually specialized in plural families. Whoa, I had no idea. Wow. So on one hand, I wish we could have seen some of those sessions. On the other hand, I'm glad we didn't because they deserve their privacy. But I kind of feel like they deserve their privacy in all contexts. <laughs> but they apparently want to be on the show, at least Cody does. And that's great. Okay, so I wonder how often they've been seeing the therapist. Also, it sounds like the therapist specializes in polygamous families. Uh, you know, they, they keep saying plural, but I think it's just a, a nice way of saying polygamous because polygamy has a bad word, has a bad connotation. Because plural could mean the other way. It could mean one woman with several husbands, but I don't think that's what they mean by plural. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe plural applies to all types. I don't know. So goodbye, my love. Our family structure is inherently complex, and that's why it's really beneficial for us to have somebody to kind of give an outside perspective and make sure we're not turning little molehills into mountains. Okay, so they're saying that, uh, Janelle is saying that that's one of the main functions of therapy is that it helps them to not turn molehills in the mountains. Yeah, that, that's a good way to put it. That's a, a, a frequent function of therapy for sure. Then we moved out of Utah. We've not been able to counsel with Pat because she doesn't practice in Nevada. Right, so because the way licensure works, if you don't have a license for the state that the clients are living in at the time or are in at the time, generally speaking, you can't provide services for them. It's ridiculous. And I'm guessing in 10 or 20 years, maybe they'll change that to just be nationwide. We should just have a nationwide licensing process. I've complained about this before. When I get a driver's license in Washington state, you know, my driver's license says Washington state on it. I can drive in any state. <laughs> I'm licensed to drive in any state. You think that's obvious, but at some point the states had to agree, we will honor a license in another state. Well, for medicine and for mental health, that's not the case. If you're licensed, I am licensed in Washington state, which means 
I can only provide services for people in Washington State. In the past, that wasn't a big deal because, it, it, well, if, if you live in Washington, then certainly the only people who can come to you are also in Washington because they have to live close enough to you to drive to your office. But now with teleservices, it's all bets are off, you know. So I'm guessing that will change. And there's been some changes, but anyway. So when they moved to Las Vegas, they couldn't see their counselor anymore. So it sounds like they're going to a new one. So what do I think? That's interesting that um, they've been going to counseling. I'm really curious as to what's been going on in those sessions. We don't have to see them, but I'd love to hear their perspective. Oh, well, this helped and I learned this or something like that. Um. So we've been discussing as a family kind of a need that we've had to once again see a marriage therapist, a family counselor. Pat went on a search and found a professional by the name of Nancy Hunterton, but Nancy has... Okay, so we saw that Pat referred the family to this therapist, presumably because she was looking for a therapist that would be cool with the polygamy thing. And we saw on the door M-A-M-F-T, which is a little confusing because usually you would say LMFT, meaning licensed in marriage family therapy. So does that mean she's not licensed? Um, I don't know. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. So it's that time of year again. It's September, back to school, time to learn new things. And if you're a fan of this podcast, then I'm guessing you like to learn new things. But you might find that although you've learned a lot, you have a hard time applying this knowledge to better your life. This can be frustrating, you know, you, like you might know why you have a particular psychological issue, but you don't know how to use that knowledge to work on the issue. Well, that's where therapy comes in. A therapist can help you see how this knowledge applies to you specifically. And therapy also just gives you the time to focus on yourself outside of daily stressors. Well, one place you can find a therapist is at BetterHelp. If you're thinking of giving therapy a try, it's definitely worth checking out BetterHelp. So rediscover your curiosity with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash Kirk today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Kirk. No experience with plural families. So later on this weekend, we're actually going to go to a retreat in Sedona, Arizona with Pat and with Nancy. And Pat is coming basically as a consultant to help Nancy in the realm of plural family. Okay, well, that's good. So the original therapist, Pat, is coming out to Nevada as a consultant to the new therapist about polygamy. So the new therapist, although I'm guessing open to working with polygamous family, doesn't know the specifics, which is a very common thing that us therapists will do. We will seek and provide consultation in cultural areas that we're not familiar with. Um, we don't always have to do that, but it's a good idea to do it. We have a, a culture of that in our in our field. Um, I've done a lot of that work both directions, so this is a good representation of that. Hi, I'm Robin. Hi, Robin. I'm Nancy. Nice to meet you. Hi, Christine. Christine, nice Hi. to meet you. Okay, I see on someone else's door, Kimberly Lander, and it says MFT intern. And that's interesting. It's just not typically the language that I would see. Although MFT intern makes more sense than MA MFT. Let me look up her license. <laughs> All right, that took longer than I thought it would, but it appears that she is licensed, I think. Nancy is going to actually start working with us, and we're going to see how this goes. Everybody got a seat? Yes. Okay. And I think our purpose today is really just to kind of figure out what you would really like from me. So I'm going to do maybe a 20-minute kind of personality test. It'll tell me a whole lot about you guys. That will have a lot to do with how we shape things. Okay, a 20-minute personality test. I wonder which one it is. Okay. Um, do we have a reader? Yes, I can read. Go. So number one, I've been romantic and imaginative, or I've been pragmatic and down-to-earth. You have to choose one or the other. Right. Okay, I'm familiar with objective personality tests, and I'm not familiar with this one. It sounds like a Myers-Briggs kind of test. Maybe 
Enneagram? I'm not sure. Plural families will not go see a therapist. And the reason is, is their main fear is that the therapist is going to tell them your problem is polygamy. I've often felt the need to be a pillar of strength. I've often felt... Yeah, I, mean, I could see therapists saying that, um, given their point of view. And they might not be wrong, right? But I would say, generally speaking... Although therapists might think that, hopefully they would keep that in check and just say, well, yeah, I've, I've asked them individually without, you know, like I've had Christine by herself, is this really the life that you want to be living? And if they were all saying yes, then okay, not my cup of tea, not what I would do, but I'm going to forge ahead. They're all here. They've stated they're, they volunteered to be in this life, and so I'm going to forge ahead and not tell them that they need to stop doing this. I might have my ideas about the inherent sexism. I might even meet individually with the women and kind of float that. But if they don't want to grab onto that as a topic, then who am I to say that they're not supposed to live that way? I mean, as therapists, we don't tell people how to live, including in situations like this. The need to perform perfectly. I don't like this Stereotypically, a highly educated career woman in the field of psychology is going to appear to be a feminist to us and maybe even a threat to the idea of our, of our family. I have tended to be... What? <laughs> What's that? <laughs> uh, uh, what? I've often felt the need to be a pillar of strength. I've often felt the need to perform perfectly. I don't like this... Were they responding to that question? I have to be a pillar of strength or... Uh, uh, I, I don't understand what they're reacting. This is edited. Stereotypically, a highly educated career woman in the field of psychology is going to appear to be a feminist. Stereotypically, a woman, a highly educated career woman, according to psychology, would be a feminist. That's such a weird statement. <laughs> I mean, I get what he's saying, and it's not inherently problematic or wrong, but it, the way he words it, it reveals his point of view and his cultural pocket, right? Because I, I would never say that. I would never assume that. I don't know what someone's point of view is or what their background is. You, you can have a highly educated career woman who, I mean, yeah, there. There are highly educated career women in politics who are outwardly anti-feminist. But, you know, I, I think I know what he's getting at. Wait, do I know what he's getting at? <laughs> what is he getting at? Us, and maybe even a threat to the idea of our, of our family. I have tended to be detached and preoccupied. I have... Yeah, it, it, it's pretty sad when you think and say that feminism would be counter to your fam. Well, unless they don't really understand. I mean, there's different versions of feminism. Um, yeah, I don't know. I guess what he's saying. It's just interesting to hear them talk explicitly about feminism when I'm always thinking it as I'm watching the show at all times and occasionally speculating. And then we get this tiny little glimpse. And I'm like, wait, what? But it was still lacking in substance and they didn't follow up. So I, I don't really know what he was saying tended to be moody and self-absorbed. I think if you were to sit and compare between men and women, women are definitely more judgmental of our lifestyle. Women go, oh my gosh, I would never let my man, blah, 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 blah. Oh, I see. So according to her anecdotally, when she reveals to people that she's in a polygamous family, that women are more likely to be upset and men are more likely to be like, ooh, that sounds nice, or I don't know, <laughs> or they're just more neutral about it or something. Yeah. And, you know, that whole phenomenon is just so strange to me. It's always been strange to me that if a polygamist family or an individual is talking to me, that I would inherently identify with the man because I'm a man, That that's just never made sense to me. <laughs> like, I can identify with anybody, <laughs> you know? I can identify with women. I, I can feel their pain. I, I can imagine myself in their shoes. 
I'm not a woman, so I don't know what it's like to live that life or to be socialized or treated that way for sure. But if I hear a story of people suffering, I don't think, wait, what gender are they? Because I don't know where I'm standing. It's sort of like when people are, you know, like a male politician will hear about women being raped or sexually assaulted or harassed. And the men are like, I have a mother and a sister and a wife, and I don't want them treated that way. And I always think, can't you just, as a human being, <laughs> know that you wouldn't, you know, like if someone's murdered and you're thinking, well, what gender were they? Um, but anyway, so for Robin, she's saying that women tend to react with more anger. Yeah, you know, I could see that. That I'm the one has to self-improve and that they don't have to. Okay, okay. You, guys, you guys stick your, name, your names on them. I'll, I'd be happy to do the scoring. Now let me listen to you for a little while. Tell me what you would really like to achieve. I would say communication. It's funny. They always say that. <laughs> I always get a little chuckle when this is essentially couples therapy and they always say communication and I always am thinking in my head that isn't really specific enough, you know? Um, it's sort of like arriving at the ER and saying, there's something wrong with my body. It's like, okay, well, you know, I mean, I don't get upset because it's always, but anyway, it's just, you hear it thousands and thousands of times and you're just like, of course, communication. Anyway, I don't know what the personality measure was if it only took 20 minutes and it was either or, I'm guessing it's Myers-Briggs because there's various different measures out there. And, and so what I'll say is that personality measures are complicated. There's a lot of research, just so much science around personality testing measures. And what I will say is that a 20 minute measure is probably not effective unless it's the schema therapy measure which can be effective but i'll tell you that myers-briggs and enneagram which are commonly used by people these days there isn't a lot of good science around it can it be helpful yeah you know i i've used enneagram my wife has used it before uh, i've used myers-briggs seemingly hundreds of times <laughs> because it's frequently imposed on me <laughs> not imposed but presented to me at work or, you know, not, not in psychology, you know, people don't, that, that's, what's kind of strange. It's like the general public, they use, well, one, they use astrology two Myers-Briggs or Enneagram. No one in psychology that I know uses those. I know one psychologist that uses Myers-Briggs, but she's like super into Jung, who is sort of like arguably like the progenitor of Myers-Briggs kind of. But anyway, we in psychology have a lot of measures for personality that are much more scientifically based and are much, they take a lot longer. I mean, that's part of it. And you have to be a particular kind of professional, usually a psychologist, to even administer and interpret it. And those individuals are kind of rare and they're expensive. So the public have to resort to these freely available measures and systems that aren't supported by science. And when everyone uses them, it gives the impression, especially when therapists use them, it gives the impression that they have scientific backing, which they don't. I mean, when you look into Enneagram, it, it's really quite silly. I did a whole episode on Enneagram. Now, I'm not saying, you know, and whenever I say this, people are like, I use Enneagram and I love it. It was, it was spot on. Yeah, if, you, if it's useful to you, great. It's no skin off my back. There's a difference between scientifically rigorous and scientifically demonstrated and something being useful. Uh, hopefully, the more scientifically rigorous things are more useful, right? Like, for example, when I did the deep dive on Enneagram with Umberto, I took the test and I was trying to remain as open as possible. And I was going through the because it, it gives you these there's nine types i believe and it gives you like one type and like a secondary type and when i read all the descriptions i found that seven out of nine fit me like there were three or four that really fit me and then like there were you know three or four that also basically fit me there was only a couple of the types that were clearly not me so what that's and this is a common way of looking at 
the validity of a personality measure is that if the claim is that everyone has one primary personality type out of the nine that they've identified, it's complicated because for people that don't know how these things work, if they take the test and you say, you're a type four with a minor in type six or something, people will read that and they'll go like, oh my God, that is so much like me. And they don't have the ability to say, well, wait a second, let me look at type seven. Does that also kind of fit me? It also kinds of, it also sort of fits me. Also eight kind of fits me. You know, most people, they don't have time. They haven't thought about it a lot. And so they just sort of take it. Plus it's kind of low stakes. Usually it's just like at work. It doesn't really matter that much anyway. So in order for a personality measure to be valid, it has to do what it claims to do, which is to draw distinct lines between the categories. And if I and many others, when you actually blind these tests, you know, one way to blind it is, is you give all nine to someone and you say, which one tends to fit you? And you don't tell them it has anything to do with Enneagram or anything like that. And if a bunch of people are like, well, probably like six of these fit me or all nine of them fit me or none of them fit me. And what you find is that if you don't prime someone with saying, hey, this test said this was for you, then with these tests, like with Enneagram and Myers-Briggs and others, they don't find that people are in these distinct groups and it doesn't tend to predict behavior. That's another part of these personality measures is that if you say, okay, you are identified as a type four, you should be able to predict on average more likely than not behaviors in the future for that person. I'm telling you all this so that you know the difference between something being scientifically rigorous that scientists and psychologists will use and that there are a different set of personality tests that are in the public that you should take with a grain of salt. If it's useful to you and it helps, you know, I, I know people where with Enneagram, for example, where it really fits for them and it fits for people in their life and is very, very helpful with their growth and their awareness and their relationships. And if that's true, then by God, use that system. <laughs> but if you take those tests, and this was always my experience with the Myers-Briggs, is I would take the Myers-Briggs and it would be explained to me and I'd be like, huh? <laughs> and the, like judgment versus perception and into like, what is going on? However, I will say that I always test Myers-Briggs wise into a category that does kind of fit me. Um, it's the teacher. I think it's like the ENFJ or I can't remember which one it is. All right. Well, that does it for that episode. Everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do.